ladies and gentlemen, Steve Osborne. I get a phone call from the Mark last week. Uh, somebody at the last minute dropped out. They couldn't do it. And they needed somebody that they could count on. So I take it as a compliment. You know, they know they could call me a week ahead of time and I'll come up with something good. My name's Steve Osborne. I was a New York City cop for 20 years. It's six o'clock in the morning and I'm just getting home from work. I walk in the door and my wife's waiting for me. And she's got that look on her face. And she says to me, I can't take this anymore. You know, I'm, I'm tired of being alone at night. I'm tired of sleeping alone. I just can't take it. It's getting to be too much. And she looks at me and she's real serious. She says to me, I want a dog. <laughs> so as soon as I hear the word dog, I'm like, Whew, man, that was close. <laughs> so I says to her, great idea. What kind of dog you want? And that's when she puts her two hands out in front of her, about 12 inches apart, and she, and she goes, one like this. Now, right away, we got a problem. <laughs> I want a big dog. She wants a little dog. But there's no way I could ever say no to my wife. It's not easy. No, you know, everybody says, oh, you look very comfortable up there. You look like a natural. But it is. It's nerve-wracking. You get up in front of 1,000 people, 2,000 people, and it's just you and a microphone. You know, there's, there's no podium to hide behind. There's no guitar to hide behind, you know. It's just you, your story and a thousand people waiting to be entertained. So she gets this dog, it's called a Brussels Griffin. I don't know if you ever heard of it. I never heard of it. It's actually not a Brussels Griffin, it's a Brussels Griffon. <laughs> That's how he's supposed to say, he's supposed to say Brussels Griffon. And Griffon, I think, is French for like very expensive dog. <laughs> but the funny thing about a dog, and especially as a, a puppy, you cannot resist a puppy. I don't care how hardcore you are, nobody can resist a puppy. And it didn't take long before me and a little guy, we bonded. He really was the definition of like a big dog in a little dog's body. And, and, and I gained a lot of respect for him. <laughs> One day me and him were out for a walk and we're about a mile from the house. When all of a sudden behind me, I hit this really loud bang. It was like a truck backfiring. Scared the hell out of me. I jumped like two feet in the air. Scared the hell out of Griff. He jumped about two feet in the air too. But when he jumped, he yanked the leash out of my hand and he took off running. Next thing I know, he's running right down the middle of the road, right in between all the cars. I take off after him. I did not care if I got plowed over by a truck. I did not care if I got killed. I had to save that little dog. And I ran after him right down the middle of the road. And next thing I know, I saw this one car was, was bearing down on him. And all I could see was he got sucked under the wheel and he got shot out the other side. I ran up to him and I just fell to my knees. And I looked down at him and I'm like, I'm sorry, buddy, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Come on, man, just hang on, keep breathing, keep breathing. Don't you go nowhere on me, come on, man. Just, just stay with me, stay with me, just keep breathing. And as I'm saying this, I'm crying. Tears are just pouring down my face and my hands shaking and I'm like sick to my stomach with grief. And all of a sudden it hits me, I'm like, this isn't me. This isn't like me, I'm a cop, man. I've, I've seen it all, I'm used to this stuff. You know, I, I've seen people shot, stabbed, beat, bludgeoned, thrown off of roofs, you know, hit by cars, trucks, buses, trains. I mean, e even an airplane crash. And I never let it get to me. But here I am, I got a dying little puppy in my arms and I'm going to pieces and I'm crying. I'm crying like a, like a little schoolgirl that got dumped on prom night. When you get up on stage and you're telling a story about something that happened to you and you're opening yourself up to the whole world, that's, that's a nerve wracking experience. I mean, you're really exposing yourself to the whole world there. And it's not an easy thing to do. I walk in the house and I go in the bedroom and I'm a mess. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know whether to go this way or that way. And all of a sudden it's just rage just built up inside of me. I was furious and you know, I was mad at myself. I was mad at the world. I was mad at God. I'm like, how could this happen? And he's just a little puppy. He didn't deserve this. And I don't know whether I wanted to punish myself or I just wanted to hit something. But I hauled off and boom, I headbutted the closet door. 
I drove my forehead right through the front of the closet door. What a shot. I was stunned. Next thing I know, I'm seeing stars. And I could hear that little voice in my head saying, dude, come on, get a hold of yourself. This is getting crazy. I go in the bathroom and I look, I look in the mirror and I got this huge lump growing out of the middle of my forehead. I look like a friggin' unicorn. <laughs> Next thing I hear the front door open and I hear her call out my name. I don't answer. She calls out Griff, obviously he's not answering. So she comes upstairs looking for me. She walks into the bedroom and I'm standing there. I got this huge red lump, this blood running down my face. I'm a mess. And she freaks out. She just starts yelling like, you know, what happened? What's going on? Where's Griff? What happened to you? And I don't remember exactly what I said because I had like a half a concussion going on at the time. But I blurted out something like, Griff got hit by a car. But with the looks of me, she assumed that I got hit by the car too. And now my wife, you know, she's normally not good in a crisis. You know, something bad happens, usually I'm the one that, you know, is the strong one. But she really rose to the occasion this time, and she took care of me. But looking back, what I can't believe is after 20 years of police work, you know, and all the things I saw, all the blood, the guts, the misery, and, and the stuff that'll just tear your heart out, you know, and I never, ever let it get to me. And that's how I got through it. And that's how I was able to deal with it. But this time I didn't have any of that. So I guess, I guess cops don't cry, or at least we, we won't allow ourselves to cry. But daddies of little puppies do. Thank you very much. And the one thing I try to accomplish, or it's always in the back of my head, after the show and after the story, I always want people to have, like, a positive image of police officers, you know. A, a lot of times people don't understand what we do for a living. And sometimes when they hear a story from me and, and we all walk away, they go their way, I go my way. But I like to leave them with a positive image of police officers and, and police work and how difficult it is to do the job. How you doing? My name's Steve Osborne. I'm an old-time storyteller from the North, and you better subscribe to Thinker.